Al, come on up. Thank you, Ivan. What a joy it is to preach God's word. And again, if you're a, a guest, or you're just scrolling through YouTube or Facebook Live, I want you to know we've been praying for you. We prayed for you before the service, and we welcome you. It's a privilege to have you with us. And um, what you're going to hear is a sermon uh, from the scriptures. So what we normally do on a Sunday morning is we preach God's word. We believe that the Bible is the word of God, inspired by God. And so we're preaching this morning from a book called Acts. Acts, A-C-T-S, Acts. And it was written about 2,000 years ago. And we've entitled this series, Shockwave, Gospel Advance in the Book of Acts. And the gospel is God's redemption story, the story of Jesus Christ, his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. And this resurrected, risen Lord Jesus Christ, who rules, continues to do and teach this gospel, making Christians, making disciples or followers of Christ, building the church. It started 2,000 years ago, and it continues today. Palm Vista is here because of the gospel we're going to read about here in the book of Acts. And today's message is about this gospel continuing to advance, Jesus continuing to do and teach through his spirit-filled followers, those of us today, back then through a particular spirit-filled follower named the Apostle Paul. Today's message is the Apostle Paul's first recorded sermon in Scripture. And it's in Acts 13, 13 to 43. And because it's a sermon, we've entitled this sermon, Preach It, Bro. Preach It, Bro. Um, 37 years ago, as God was transitioning me from what I thought was going to be a career in politics and law to the calling to be a pastor, uh, I had to go back and get some undergraduate Bible courses. And when I was going to a Bible school to get some of those undergraduate Bible courses before going on to seminary, uh, th there was a, a guy in our Bible school 37 years ago by the name of Robert, who was one of the most enthusiastic listeners of sermons I've ever been around. I mean, Robert loved God. Robert was a recent convert. Uh, Robert was a funny guy. He was a little bit awkward socially, uh, but he was a great guy. And man, when the sermon began, Robert would be on the edge of his seat. Robert had this enthusiasm, this alertness, this intensity. He, I mean, the sermon, God's word would just impact his life. So much so that invariably, probably halfway through the sermon, Robert couldn't hold it back any further and he would rear his head back and at the top of his voice, he would yell, preach it, bro, because he was excited. He was, he was excited about the sermon the way most people are excited about their favorite event, whether it's a movie, whether it's ballet, whether it's ice skating or whether it's basketball. He was excited like all those Miami Heat fans were excited way back in 2013 in game six of the NBA finals when the Heat were down by three with seconds to go and Chris Bosh grabs the rebound and throws it to a backpedaling Ray Allen who gets his feet right behind the three-point line and jumps up and hits the perfect three-point shot to tie the game and the place erupted. That was Robert when he heard God's word preached. And that should be you and me when we hear God's word preached. This morning is about a sermon. It's about the Apostle Paul's first sermon. And I wanna give you the context of that first sermon. So as we go through it, we can understand exactly what's happened. So to do that, I'm going to use our map and I'm going to remind you of something that we have been preaching the last couple of weeks. So if you look at the map, you'll, you will see, you will kind of get oriented. Syria is on the right-hand side of the map. Right above Syria is Antioch. And we know that God sent Paul and Barnabas from Antioch, and they sailed over to the island of Cyprus, where they preached the gospel through the island of Cyprus. God saved many people to include the ruler, the Roman ruler of that island, established many churches. And now in today's message, they're going to depart this island. 
And I want to keep the map up there as I read to you from our text, the context of the sermon we're about to hear. So Acts chapter 13, look at verse 13. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos, that's on the western tip of the island of Cyprus, and came to Perga, which is modern day Turkey, in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. So John Mark, who had been with them, goes back to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. So that's a different Antioch. It's called Pisidian Antioch. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue, which had been their normal pattern to go into the synagogue to preach about Jesus and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, it's interesting. This is one of the early historical accounts of what went on in a typical synagogue in the first century. They read from the law, the first five books of the Old Testament, and the prophets, those prophetic books in the Old Testament. So after the reading from the law and the prophets, verse 15, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, to Barnabas and Paul, saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up And motioning with his hand said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. And that last word in verse 16 is God's burden to you and to me today. Whether you're listening to this as the first time you've ever heard a Christian sermon from a Christian pastor, or whether you've been a Christian all your life, whether you're a member of Palm Vista, or you're just cruising through and listening to a sermon because it's interesting, God is speaking to you right now from this word, and he's saying, listen. That's the main point. And, And in this sermon today, this sermon about a sermon, God is gonna teach us how to listen. He's going to teach us what to listen for. So this morning, it's an imperative. Listen. God is saying to you, listen. Paul said to his audience 2,000 years ago, listen. God says to us this morning, listen. And in the text, he's going to teach us two things. He's going to teach us what to listen for, how to listen to a sermon, what to listen for. And then how to respond to what we have listened to, what to listen for, and how to respond to what we have listened to. So point one, what do we listen for? We listen for God's promise of redemption fulfilled in history. We listen for God's promise of redemption fulfilled in history. So most likely the apostle Paul, when he stood up to preach, he stood up to preach about the two texts that were read that day in the synagogue. In verse 15, it tells us clearly they read from the law and the prophets. Most likely they read from Deuteronomy chapter four, verses 25 to 26. That text would have been God confronting Israel about their idolatry and their evil ways. And then they would have read probably, and I think this one is far more certain, from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 6 to 16. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 6 to 16. And that text was about God's promise to restore, redeem, save, and bring a king to his people who would rule forever. So let me give you a sample of that text. Here on the screen is 2 Samuel 7, 12. It's right in the middle of that section that I mentioned to you. And listen to what probably was read that day. And this would be the text. This would be the text that Paul is preaching. I'm preaching Acts 13, 13 to 43. Paul is preaching this text. All right. So this is what he preached on. When your days are fulfilled, who's the your there? King David, who ruled about 1000 BC. So Samuel is giving King David God's prophetic word. Samuel is saying to David, when your days are fulfilled, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, i.e. David, when you die, I will raise up your offspring. God is speaking. I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. 
Well, the congregation that Paul was preaching to in Pisidian Antioch in 46, 47 AD was asking the same question every Jew had asked since they read this account in Samuel. Who is the offspring? Because they knew that this offspring was the promised Messiah, the promised Savior, the promised King who would rule the Davidic kingdom, not as a son of David per se, but as David's Lord, and he would rule it forever and ever and ever. This is the promise. So they're wondering, who is this offspring? And Paul's sermon is about that offspring. And he begins his sermon in verse 17 by reminding them of God's promise in redemptive history. So he's going to start with God's promise in redemptive history. We don't know how far back he went all the way, but for sure in verse 17, he starts with God choosing Israel. Look at it with me. Acts 13, 17. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers. That means that he chose our fathers. The first father is Abraham, right? Father Abraham. So probably going all the way back to the promise God gave Abraham through you and your seed, your offspring, I will bless all the nations and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. Now he's talking about 500 years later, plus in around 1500 BC, when now God is choosing Israel and going to deliver them from slavery in Egypt. So he says here, and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt and lift an uplifted arm. He had them, he led them out of it. So he's talking about leading them out of Egypt. He's reviewing redemptive history. Verse 18. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. (laughs) That's a good passage. And after destroying seven nations, In the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. So now he's advancing them all the way from 1500 BC, all the way to about the time of David. And he's, he gave them the promised land and he's given them judges. And now he's going to bring them to the time of David, 1000 BC, Abraham, 2000 BC, freedom from Egypt, 1500 BC. Don't you see he's going through redemptive history. Verse 21, then they asked a king for a king and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do my will. I want to pause here. I don't want to, I don't want to blow by that last statement. God chose David, just like he chose Abraham, just like he chose Israel and Egypt. He chose David. He didn't choose David because David was a sinless man. Because friend, according to biblical history, David was an adulterer and a murderer. And yet it says that he was a man after God's own heart. Why? Because of this offspring who will come from his loins, who will be the savior of those who sin against God. The one who will enable God's people to find favor with God. That's how he could say David was a man after his own heart. And now, so he's preaching the sermon, right? And so far, no one's, no one's probably saying, preach it, bro. They're like, yeah, we learned this in Sunday school. We learned this in Hebrew school. We know what you're talking about, but here we go. You ready? Here's where the thing kind of gets nuclear. Verse 23 on the screen of this man, which man, David of this man's offspring. This is Paul now preaching, right? Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. And at that point, you heard a few people say, preach it, bro. You heard a a few people say, amen, like we just heard someone here say. You may have heard a few people say, oh my. You may have heard some groans. I'll tell you what you didn't hear. You didn't hear anybody sleeping. This wasn't a boring message. This message either fired you up like, yes, or got you mad like, no. Because what what Paul is preaching is Jesus is the promised offspring who is the Messiah, who is the Savior, who is the King who will rule forever and ever. That That was a shockwave, guys. That's the gospel advancing in the synagogue. Paul goes on to preach in verse 24. Before his coming... 
John, John the Baptist, had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me is one coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. So Paul has started with Abraham in 2000 BC, and he's brought them all the way to Jesus and his birth and said, this is the one that was promised to Abraham, the blessing of the nations that was promised to Moses, a prophet greater than Moses and was promised to David, an offspring, an offspring that will rule forever and ever. Now I can hear the rising preach it bros. Now I can hear the congregation responding that to what Paul is preaching. Listen, Clearly to you, clearly to you, if you're a believer or an unbeliever, if you're a Christian, if you're a Muslim, if you're a Hindu, if you're a Buddhist, if you're an agnostic, whatever you are, let me be clear about this. What Paul is preaching, what I'm preaching is that Jesus Christ is the eternal son of God, who is the promised savior, who is the king that rules forever and ever and ever. And that's why these Jews who had been waiting for that king said, preach it, bro. They, they understood what Paul was saying. But let me tell you something. The whispers of preach it, bro, are about to erupt into shouts of preach it, bro, because the second thing that we're to listen for and the thing that Paul is about to preach is that this promised offspring of David rose from the dead. And that's the second thing that we should listen for. We should listen for the significance of Jesus resurrection. Member of Palm Vista, Christian, my desire is to teach you how to listen to a sermon. It's to teach you how to listen to a biblical sermon. It's to teach you to listen, how to listen to the, how to read the Bible. The, Jesus Christ is the lens through which we read the entire scriptures. From the first pages, when God promised that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the seed of serpent, he's talking about Jesus, to the last pages in Revelation, where the kingdom of God and God restores heaven and earth, the new heavens and the new earth. They're all about Jesus and his resurrection is central to that. The resurrection of Jesus sets Christianity apart. Every other religious leader is dead. Jesus is alive. Jesus lives that's what he's preaching here. And that's what we must see. So let's take a look at it. Verse 27. For those who live in Jerusalem. So now, now Paul is bringing them to what's happened in the last 15 years. He's preaching this around 47 AD. What he's preaching about here. Those who live in Jerusalem happened in 33 AD. So maybe 15 years earlier. Probably a lot of them remember that what happened. They, re- they have a memory, right? You remember what happened 15 years ago? I do. Although my memory is not as good as it used to be. I do. Okay. So now he's talking about modern day history for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, the him there is Jesus, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath fulfilled them by condemning him, Jesus. And though they found in him, no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. Most people remember that. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. Unbeliever, uh, non-Christian, with all due respect, first of all, thank you for listening. This is part of the gospel. The death of Christ on the cross is a key part of the gospel because what, what no one saw, no one saw it, is that God would come in the flesh as a human, Jesus Christ. The king, the king would come as a baby. And he would live a perfect life. And then he would die on the cross to pay the penalty for God's people. He would be rejected so that God's people would be accepted. He would be condemned so that we would be given God's favor. He would take our sin becoming sin that we would receive his righteousness. It's a great exchange. It had to happen. It's miraculous. No one understood it. Not even Satan. Nobody. In fact, Satan thought he'd won when Jesus died on the cross, but he didn't. Jesus had to die on the cross to take our sins. But look at verse 30. Look at verse 30 with me. Find it. Acts 13, 
Verse 30, beautiful verse. And I love that word, one of my favorite words there. But, but God raised him, Jesus, from the dead. And for many days, he appeared, he, Jesus, appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to his people. So what Paul is saying is, listen, he died on the cross for, for our sins, but he rose from the dead by the power of God. And there are many witnesses. By the way, Paul was one of those witnesses. The resurrected Lord Jesus appeared to Paul at his conversion in Acts chapter 9. Barnabas was a witness. Barnabas would have been in Jerusalem. Barnabas would have seen all of this. Over 500 people saw the resurrected Jesus. He's alive is what Paul is saying. He's alive. And now, why was it so important that Jesus be raised from the dead? Look at verse 32 on the screen. Verse 32. And we bring You, the good news, unbeliever, non-Christian, here's good news. Christian, here's good news. Everybody, here's good news. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, what did he promise to the fathers? An offspring, David's offspring, to rule forever and ever in a kingdom that never ends. He's going to fulfill that promise. How? Verse 33. This he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. By raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second Psalm. He's now going to quote Psalm 2-7. Remember, in the synagogue service, they've already read Deuteronomy 4, most likely. I think they definitely read uh, 2 Samuel 7. And now Paul's going to read Psalm 2-7. Very important psalm. It's quoted many times in the New Testament. In my quiet time this morning, I was just reading through Hebrews. It was quoted in Hebrews 5, the passage I read this morning. This is what Psalm 2-7 says. You are my son. Today, I have begotten you. Jesus has begotten, not made. He's the eternal son of God. Has always been, will always be. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is the son. He is the son of God of God. He is David's son, who is David's Lord, Psalm 110. He is the one who can reign on God's eternal kingdom because he lives forever. That's the good news. Hey, this king is Jesus and he rose from the dead and he's never going to die again. Ever, ever. That's good news. That's really good news. And then he continues. Verse 34, and as for the fact that he, God, the father raised him, God, the son, Jesus Christ from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken in this way. And now Paul is going to quote from Isaiah 55, three, another old Testament uh, text. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. What are the holy and sure blessings of David? It's the promise of an eternal kingdom. To have an eternal kingdom, you have to have an eternal king that will never die. Hence, his resurrection is such good news. He's the eternal king of the eternal kingdom. And then Paul brings it home. And by this point, we got got preacher bros happening. We got it. Alleluia is happening. If it's a Hispanic Pentecostal church, we got a su nombre and people yelling Gloria, a su gloria, la victoria. We got people dancing. Who knows? We got stuff happening. All right. It's good news. Listen, you ought to be excited about this because in a moment we're going to see the ramifications of all this, the significance of all this for you and me today. Verse 35. Final quote is from Psalm 1610. Verse 35, therefore, he says also in another Psalm 1610, you will not let your Holy one, says Jesus, the promised offspring, the King, the Messiah, the Savior, see corruption. Look at verse 36. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep, died, and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. All he's preaching here is what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Hey folks, all these Psalms, they're not talking about David because David saw corruption. He's in that tomb and the worms have eaten his flesh. That's corruption. There's bones in there, but he's seen corruption. 
Jesus does not, will never see corruption. He rose from the dead three days after his death. That's good news. That's really, really good news. Verse 40, 37. And he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Now, there have been preach it bros, but just like every sermon, Paul's going to bring this truth to a very personal level. I think when Paul got to this place, conviction set in on many of these folks. I think it was a good conviction. You know how when you can cry and it's a good cry? Where you're crying, realizing that God has set you free from something you could ne never set yourself free from. When you realize that you were condemned, but now you are accepted. You were, you, you were, you were in big trouble and now you've received help. I think that's what happens in this part of Paul's sermon. On the screen, verse 38. Let it be known to you, therefore. What's that therefore, therefore? All the whole sermon was to bring us to this point. All that is true. All that history is true. Therefore, here's the payoff. Brothers, that through this man, Jesus, the God man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. See, what he's saying, that those sins that rightfully brought God's wrath upon us, those sins that condemned us and crushed us and separated us from God, those sins that caused us not only to sin against God, but to sin against one another, we have been forgiven of those sins through Christ's death and resurrection. They go together. Christ's death and resurrection. That's what he's saying to them. I'm going to give you a sneak peek into that second part of what I said to you, that God's teaching us what to listen for and then how to respond to what we've listened to. You know how you respond to that kind of truth? You repent and you believe it. Yes. If you're a non-Christian, God is saying to you that in Christ, he has taken the condemnation, the wrath, the death that is yours because of your sin, rightly so, put it on Christ and giving you forgiveness of your sins. Christian, and I'm, I'm pointing at you, but I got three fingers pointing back at myself. We need to repent of thinking that our sins can separate us from God as his believers. We, we must repent of thinking that I can sin beyond God's love, that I can do something that's beyond God's forgiveness. That's wrong. And I must repent and believe that Christ loves me. And, and he, doesn't, he doesn't say it's okay to sin. He will deal with me. Our father will deal with this as fathers do, do in loving discipline. But he loves me. He doesn't love me any less when I sin. He doesn't love me any more when I don't. He loves me in Christ who's my perfection. And that leads me to the second point. Verse 39. Not only do we have forgiveness of sins, but look at 39. And by him, Jesus, everyone who believes, we must believe, is freed from everything which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. See, the law of Moses says, God is perfect. And I must be perfect to be his son or his daughter. And I can't be. Jesus came as God in the flesh to live the perfect life and then to willingly go to the cross and become sin and to take all of our sin and all of our imperfections and to take all of the junk of this earth, to take it upon himself in agony and to be rejected of the father and to die on the cross. And when he said it is finished, it is finished. God paid. Jesus paid the penalty for my sin. Therefore, I cannot be penalized for it. There's no double jeopardy with God, nor in our legal system, by the way. It's already been adjudicated. Justice has been served. Christian, Jesus took the penalty for your sin. Stop trying to do penance to take the penalty for it. See, what he's freed us from is having to be perfect. Because we can't be. The law cannot free you from that. The law tells you who God is. And he is that. 
Jesus tells you what God has done for you who are imperfect, but upon whom he's put his love, like David, who was a man after God's own heart, and yet he was a murderer and an adulterer, but God in Christ forgave his sins because he had faith, and it's the same for you, and it's the same for me. Our sin was imputed on Christ. It was put on Jesus and his righteousness was imputed and given to us. Therefore, since he was perfect, we are set free. Corey preached this text some eight years ago. And when I was reading through his notes, I was, I was taken by this one section and I'm going to use that section right now in my sermon. He listed some results. He listed the significance of Jesus' resurrection for us today. And the first one is, because Jesus was strong for me, I am free to be weak. My single brother or sister, and particularly the single sisters, it's wearying to be strong every day, isn't it? Come home alone. You got to be strong, especially in South Florida. Strong on so many fronts. Jesus was strong for you. If you're a parent, you feel overly burdened. You feel confused. You're stressed out. You're weak. Jesus was strong for you. Listen, right now, I feel particularly weak as a pastor. There are things that are outside of my control a place for us to meet. Talking with Hive, they want to have us there, Hive Prep School, but they're concerned about the spike in coronavirus. Their board met last week. We're awaiting word from them. In the meantime, you know, we feel like a bunch of vagabonds. (laughs) Now, right now, most churches aren't meeting, but soon we will meet again. And we're praying for a place to meet. I feel so weak. I feel so helpless. But you know what? I can be free to be weak and helpless because Jesus is my strength. This morning, I was thinking about this and I felt like the Lord gave me a scripture. I think this scripture is for some of you. Certainly is for me. I'm going to put it on the screen here for you to read with me. Hebrews chapter four, verses 14 to 16. Hebrews chapter four, verses 14 to 16. Take this as a word. Write it down. Meditate on it later today if you feel weak. Since then, we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. We do have a high priest. Jesus, the son of God, who rose from the dead and rules and reigns from heaven. And he intercedes for us. Therefore, we can hold fast to our confession. And, and, and our confession is Christ. Look at verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. See, God came in the flesh to know what it's like to be a human in the flesh. And he lived as a human in the flesh. And he knows what it is to be tempted. He knows that. And to be tired and thirsty. He knows all that. But look what it says in the second half of verse 15. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He was perfect. He knows. He understands what you're going through. And then verse 16 is the payoff. Verse 16 bids us and calls us to come to him. Here's the significances of Christ's resurrection is that we have a throne that's no longer a throne of judgment, but a throne of grace where we're going to find mercy and find grace to help at our time of need. Verse 16, let us then with confidence on days that we do well, on days we mess up with confidence, draw near to the throne of what? Of grace of grace because Jesus rose from the dead that we may receive mercy. Oh, we need mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Friends, not only can we be weak because Jesus was strong for me, but second, because Jesus won for me, I'm free to lose. You don't have to win every argument online. You don't have to win every discussion. Look, I can even be seen as a loser by this world. 
But Jesus won, and that's my victory. Amen. Next, because Jesus is someone, I am free to be no one. I don't have to strive to be known to get clicks online or likes or how many people are following me. Or even sometimes I'll think, how many people listen to this sermon? Who cares? God's listening. Amen. And you, my friends, are listening. Amen. And even if none of you were listening, they're listening. <laughs> and I love them. Preach that, bro. I don't have to be popular. That's a horrible treadmill to run, isn't it? It's exhausting. Try to get everybody to like you all the time. Next, because Jesus was extraordinary, I am free to be ordinary. Oh, that's so liberating. The law can never set me free from that. I can be an ordinary pastor. It's okay. You can be an ordinary parent, friend, roommate, in your business, whatever you do. You're free to be ordinary because Jesus is extraordinary. And finally, because Jesus succeeded for me, I am free to fail. What I love about this is it releases us, church, to go for it, unafraid of failure. So what? Jesus succeeded. I'm free to fail. And you know what else it sets me free from? It sets me free from pretending any longer. It's exhausting to pretend to be successful. To pose that one picture from a five-day vacation where everybody was smiling and not trying to kill each other and say we had a great vacation. Come on. <laughs> eh, not really. But everybody thinks you did. Come on. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. I'm free to be real, but like real in a biblical sense. Well, as I've already mentioned, the way we should listen to these sermons is communicated by the last verses in this text. The Apostle Paul said, be careful, guys, verses 38 to 41. Don't scoff at this. Don't reject this. Please repent and believe. And so my heart to you, dear Christian, here's the appeal. Would you believe that you cannot sin your way outside of God's love? His grasp, you can't sin beyond it. There's nowhere you can go, Psalm 139 says, that God isn't there, even at the depths of the sea. They say that the most lost you can be is to be lost at sea, some of the great oceans in this world. I think there's a plane that crashed several years ago. It's still lost because it was in some great ocean. No one will ever find it. If you're lost at the depths of 5,000 feet in the most obscure ocean in the world, God's right there with you. Right there with you. Right there with you. Believe that. Run to the throne of grace. Receive the freedom you have in Christ and then go set others free. Let us preach it with our lips. Let us preach it with our lives. Unbeliever. Ah, oh, repent and believe. Good news is Jesus rose from the dead. He's the savior of those who believe in him. We're going to conclude our service with a prayer, and then we're going to sing a song called Death Was Arrested. This song speaks of our life beginning when Jesus rose from the dead. And oh, it has, and it will continue forever in the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would give us your grace this morning. Lord, I pray that you would give us your mercies. Father, we come to your throne of grace as a church and we ask for this mercy and this grace to help us in our time of need. In a time when we may be feeling condemned, lost, alone, there may be some here that doubt your love for them because they've sinned beyond your love. Lord, would you rip that lie out of their minds and replace it with the truth that Christ was condemned crucified, judged, wrath of God upon him. He was rejected that they might be accepted. Lord, we ask for help when we worry about what the future will hold. Lord, let us proclaim now in this song that when death was arrested, our lives, our corporate lives began. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand with wherever you are and let's sing this song together. Alone in my 
my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains And my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested, my life began Oh, your grace so free Washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your endless love Pouring down on us You have made us new Now life begins with you Release from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore oh, He cancelled my debt and he called me his friend When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace, oh, your grace, so free Washes over me You have made us new Now life begins with you It's your endless love It's your endless love Pouring down on us You have made us new Now life begins with you Friends, this is the gospel here. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Yes. And darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began oh oh your grace so free washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless life it's your endless love Pouring down on us You have made us new Now life begins with you Sing this out Oh, we're free, free Forever we're free Come join the song of all the redeemed Oh, we're free, free Forever, amen When death was arrested And my life began Oh, we're free, free Forever, we're free Come join the song Of all the redeemed Yes, we're free, free Forever, amen When death was arrested And my life began Oh, when death was arrested And my life began Oh, when death was arrested And my life began Amen. Well, church, receive this blessing. You can look right here, right in the camera. Look into my eyes. Uh, this is what God is saying to you. This is what God says to you in Christ. Those whom the Spirit has, been, have, has set free, those whom Christ has set 
free. Those whom the Father has set free. Those whom the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit has set free are free indeed. Amen. You're free. You cannot free yourself. The law cannot free you. You can't be perfect enough. You can't be good enough. You can't be smart enough. You can't be attractive enough. You can't make enough money. But God has set you free. Amen. Go and set others free with this gospel message. Yes. Amen? amen? And amen. God bless you, Palm Vista. We'll see you next week.